What is up, YouTube? Welcome back to my crypto journey. My name is Rodney, and I'm about to play a highlight reel of all the things that Charles Hoskinson said this morning and all the questions he answered this morning uh, when he appeared before the U.S. House of Representatives. Now, I thought this was a fantastic showcase to the rest of the world on the great minds that we have in cryptocurrency. And if you missed the stream this morning, that's why I wanted to make this uh, video for you guys so you guys can get caught up to speed. So without further ado, let's jump into the video. Make sure you hit that like button and Let's jump into it. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Hoskinson, please, uh, and chain analysis rolls right off the tongue. Uh, thank you, sir. And Mr. Hoskinson, you may proceed. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Fishbach, members of the subcommittee, and congressional staffers who worked so hard. Thank you for inviting me to testify at this hearing. I applaud the work of this subcommittee, and I appreciate you all taking the time to provide a forum for the blockchain industry. The blockchain industry has grown over the past decade from a small group of uncommercialized volunteer developers, and it was very small, believe me, to a trillion dollar global economy encapsulating sophisticated engineering, scientific research, publicly traded companies, and millions of users. While our remarkable growth yields significant opportunities ranging from infrastructure security to entirely new economies like metaverses and NFTs, it also has presented new challenges and amplified the existing problems. Our legacy systems cannot handle the rapid movement of value without counterparty risk and require centralized middlemen. Our regulatory tools, risk management systems, and oversight processes were never designed for such speed, scale, and rapid evolution. For example, in just four years, our industry has touched concepts ranging from IPOs to intellectual property to completely new business structures called DAOs that are effectively leaderless and jurisdiction free. Reflecting upon the 20th century, the dominance of the United States has rested upon three pillars our financial services, our technology companies, and our manufacturing capabilities. These industries are rapidly transforming under the demands of globalization, increased competition, new technologies, and our desire to define ESG rules to ensure a sustainable values-driven global economy. At our core, our industry's technology is about creating distributed ledgers to store information that needs to be transparent, auditable, time-stamped, and immutable. This process enables records of social and economic concerns to be reliable and programmable. For example, as a rancher, I have to deal with water rights, grazing leases, BLM land, and numerous other agreements, contracts, and economic events. Many of these are not digitized, nor are they shared in ways to provide emergent value to policymakers, regulators, and researchers. The consequences of this fragmentation and lack of digitization are a large amount of inefficiency, replication of work, and a lack of access for entrepreneurs and innovators who could build new products and services that would dramatically reduce costs and improve efficiency for all stakeholders. The power of blockchain technology is its universality and permissionless model for innovation. Our company input-output has never had to pay a royalty, file a patent application, or acquire a license to pursue business in countries as diverse as Ethiopia to Mongolia. Thus, we have to understand that categories-based regulation that is segregated to the borders of a particular jurisdiction and relies upon centralized actors for reporting and disclosure is unlikely to be effective and frankly will inhibit regulation. Furthermore, the Internet's governance, evolution, and innovation are controlled by the ITU or some other transnational body, but rather by thousands of interconnected and interdependent agencies and private companies working towards the self-emerging common goals of increased connectivity, capacity, and utility. If we are to discuss how to regulate our industry, protect consumers, and align growth with the realities of modern society, then we ought to have the humility to admit innovation makes specifics difficult. We should focus on principles instead. Blockchains enable the liquidity of value, thought, and commerce at a scale and speed society has never enjoyed before. Instead of predicting the outcome of these new capabilities, we ought to decide on what risks we must guard against, what fundamental rights consumers should have, and how to use new tools for the greatest possible good. It seems prudent to focus on concepts like measuring decentralization, information asymmetries, accessibility of data, and access rather than arguing about jurisdictional bodies or asset categorization. Cryptocurrencies are financial stem cells at their core. They can be nearly any asset and can change over time. Principles don't change. 
For example, the notion of measuring consolidation and its risks has been an endeavor the United States has pursued and is frankly good at since the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. While none of us are personally familiar with life in the 1890s, we'd certainly be comfortable with the intent and concepts behind the Sherman Antitrust Act. Centralization of markets and power seldom leads to good outcomes. I hope we can engage in a fruitful and ongoing dialogue throughout the coming months as the United States debates the regulatory future of the American blockchain and cryptocurrency industry. Like the prior Congresses in the 1990s discussing the regulatory framework for the internet that led to the rise of trillion dollar companies, I believe this Congress can achieve great results by working with our industry and a principles-based legislative approach and leveraging our capabilities to innovate and adapt. Thank you all for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Huskinson. Uh, this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members. Appreciate the information. And um, Mr. Mr. Had Hoskinson, did I say that? <laughs> I'm trying. Yes. Thank you very much. And I know we just have a few seconds left, but there's a lot of discussion about whether we should regulate certain cryptocurrency as commodities or securities. Um, you know, what do you think might the benefits? And maybe you could talk just a little bit about that. Um, you know, what are the drawbacks, things like that? Well, with uh, 37 seconds. No, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, no, the gentleman can take as much time as he requires. Oh, thank you, oh, Mr. Well, I, there I appreciate you go. that. Thank you. I mean, don't push it, but... Um, <laughs> it's a gotta, fine line here. You've got to be careful. I'm Italian. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you look at cryptocurrencies in general, they, I've always viewed them like financial stem cells. They're, they're, they're kind of more fundamental than a particular category, like a currency or a commodity. And really, it depends on the markets they're traded on and the use and utility that they have. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what public policy considerations are you attempting to satisfy? Is it sanctions compliance? Is it consumer protection? Is it market stability? What we do as an industry is we're all about transparency. So it's kind of funny we're talking and debating about disclosure regimes. There's no other financial asset in the world that really is as transparent as a cryptocurrency. Every transaction from the very beginning for Bitcoin, for example, from January 3rd, 2009 is known. Every single one, the holdings of the founder are known because all of these things are publicly available to everybody. So it's more about, in my view, understandability and the tooling required to make this work on a global basis. Uh, so I don't think it would be wise to say, well, is it a security or a commodity or fall into this temptation of who's the more permissive regulator or what is the regulatory arbitrage, but rather just take a step back and say, what things do we want to guard against? And we now have 13 years of history as an industry of of, I think six or seven collapses, uh, a whole bunch of interesting new things like NFTs uh, that have always pushed the limit, and a global marketplace with more than 100 million people floating around that we can draw from and we can look on a case-by-case -case basis and build a, a framework that makes sense. What's encouraging to me as an entrepreneur, briefly, is that there's a lot of great legislation that's been proposed recently, like the DCA, the FIA, I. Uh, there's executive orders that have come through that are trying to force clarity amongst the executive branch. So these things together create a global dialogue, and if we're clever about it, I think we can converge to a reasonable compromise that we as an industry can live with and continue to be competitive with. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for that answer. Would anybody else like to add on to the, the question? Okay. I'll take a bite at it. All right. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I am not a securities lawyer or an expert on regulation, so uh, take it with a grain of salt. But um, I don't think it's a question of, as I mentioned before, uh, who is more permissive or who's less restrictive. It's, it's more of a question of efficacy. And when you look at commodities, commodities are intrinsically decentralized. So I, I grow hay on one of my farms. And I didn't have to ask permission. There's no central hay agency. We're not the Soviet Union. We, uh, we don't regulate things that way. And then suddenly when I cut it and I sell it, it enters into a global marketplace. Now that marketplace has rules and principles and protections. And there's a retail component. People feed horses. And then there's certainly an industrial component. So if cryptocurrencies are truly decentralized and that actually is a real thing, then it does make sense to embed that into a framework that's designed for things that are intrinsically this way. 
Uh, and you have to look out for cartels, market manipulation. You have to look out for where global actors try to come in, like China or others, and take over a market like they're trying to do the lithium markets. But that's a very different type of notion than a security in that respect. So uh, my view, the most effective thing that can be done over the next 12, 24 months is to have a really good notion of what is decentralization and what are the factors that produce that and if it gets past a certain threshold, it makes a lot of natural sense to regulate things like a commodity as opposed to a security. And if they don't, well, then it's very obvious who has the disclosure requirement. Well done. Uh, so thank you for your answer. Mr. Chairman, with the uh, lack of remaining time, I'll, I'll yield. About if they gave up everything that they're currently doing, you're talking about, you know, a hundred cryptocurrencies a person. It, it, my, 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 point is, my point is, it's not, it's not possible to regulate all of these currencies. It, it, it's just not. Um, and so then the question becomes who? And I mean, is it that we're going to have a value if the, if the currency reaches a, a certain dollar figure that all of a sudden we're going to regulate it? Uh, I'm interested in any comments that any of you may have on, of the 20,000 cryptos, how you determine who uh, should be regulated. Well, uh, one of the powers of our industry is the fact that regulation can become algorithmic. Um, so you don't have to think, well, which person's going to sit down and look at this big pile? Uh, think of the IRS and tax returns. We could quadruple the size of the IRS. We still couldn't audit every single American. It's just not possible. And so what you have to do is say, what tools do we have at our, our capability? And what's magical about cryptocurrencies is that in the transactions themselves, they can carry metadata. They can carry identity. Uh, rule makers and policy makers can take a step back and say, well, these are the things that we're, we care about. And we can make sure inside the systems that uh, those things don't settle and clear until those things are present. So, so it's really more of a conversation of, of what do you care about? And then what we can do as technologists is create a self-certification system. And then what can happen is when there are anomalies or special cases, which often would be rare, then the CFTC or another regulatory body could look through and say, well, let's investigate that. That's generally how we do law enforcement in the nation. Uh, we don't break into everybody's house. We wait until we get a warrant, and you have to have some cause for it. So there needs to be some social infrastructure for so, that. So self-certification is different than an agency regulating. Well, they're interconnected. Um, so you have SROs, you have um, market standards, you, you have principles, and in many cases, financial regulation is mostly uh, done by SROs or private organizations. If you look at, for example, compliance, it's not the SEC or the CFTC going out there doing KYC and AML, it's banks that are doing these types of things. So it's a public-private partnership, and what needs to be done is to establish those boundaries, and then what we can do as innovators is write software to help make that happen. And literally, that's what Chanalysis is doing right now and their competitors. I, I, I think, I mean, I mean, I don't see a way for the, the, us to, to regulate them all. I do think there's got, if it's going to happen, there has to be some type of self-certification uh, of it. What, what, I, what I do fear, because I, I don't think that crypto should be a significant portion of the average investor's portfolio. I, I, I don't. I mean, I, and uh, I do fear that if we all of a sudden are regulating it, then the average investor feels like there's more security and stability in, in the value of it. And I think that's a dangerous thing for the investors. And, and I'm, I would tell you, I'd be very concerned about the average American citizen having more than 5% of their investments in in the crypto markets. I'm not talking about guys like you who, who, who know it inside and out, but um, I just, I've expressed my concerns. I appreciate your comments on the self-certification. Uh, I do think that's a path that we need to be considering. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield uh, the remainder of my time. I appreciate the uh, gentleman yielding his three seconds. Uh, Mr. Feenstra is recognized. Want to speak to that or? I have another question to move on to. Sure. Uh, can I comment on the KYC AML? Sir? Sure. <laughs> um, I, I don't think anybody's doing KYC AML well, and nobody wants to be a data broker. It's uh, 
pretty crazy what's going on right now. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer that you have to understand what private industry has been doing over the last uh, century or so. If you look at Google, you look at Facebook, you look at these companies, they're more than companies. They don't just go and make sprockets and cars or something and they compete in a fair market. They're ending up getting a lot of control and power over foundational resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we look at the prior centuries, like Standard Oil, it got control over the energy industry. And then we said, boy, that's probably not a good idea. We should do something about it. Now when we look at Google, Facebook, these other uh, companies, they've gained so much control over information, thought, speech, and uh, other foundational resources, hosting. They actually can define an entire marketplace and decide who gets to compete and who doesn't. It's relevant to cryptocurrencies and the blockchain industry because at the end of the day, it's the liberation of those resources. That's what we're really doing here. To separate the wheat from the chaff, we're talking about a resource-based economy. And the point of decentralization is saying that maybe nobody should be in control of our freedom of expression or commerce or our association. Uh, so that requires a fundamentally different way of interfacing with those marketplaces, different way of handling identity and compliance. A I only have a minute, so if I, I can sure. jump in here. The, the fact that you're talking about big tech, I think, is very interesting in this, because you also mentioned that one of the features of regulation is that we can use al algorithms now. That's Yet right. We've seen them use algorithms to limit people's freedom of speech and to do all these other nefarious things. So if we give the government that power, especially you know, as the Federal Reserve is looking toward creating a digital currency, potentially, and we already have banks being thrust upon them to enforce ESG scores. And in China, we see where those ESG scores suddenly become personal scores on individuals. It's not a far step technologically and in the way we see some, some, some of the agencies working right now to begin to target those algorithms toward right. people and their personal habits and, and their spending. So how do we compete economically on the world stage without threatening the privacy rights of Americans I, going forward? Because this is a very dangerous slope if not handled correctly. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm deeply concerned by social credit, deeply concerned by some of the proposals for CBDCs because you can have transactional discrimination against any ethnic group you want or any political philosophy you want. So the point is the algorithms ought to be built out in an open source process, uh, transparent and available to all, and people have to have the ability to opt in instead of opt out. Uh, so the power of our industry is we didn't have a government agency or some central actor say, oh, here's cryptocurrencies. It was the tireless work of millions of people, many of which never met each other, around the world coming together voluntarily and building a new economy worth trillions of dollars. That's the way we ought to think about it, not um, how do we create some government agency or how do we create some central bank or central algorithm that will control everything. And then you ask yourself about the outcomes you desire. So it's clear that there's been some problems over the last 13 years and we're working our way through that. But at the same time, we have created value for millions of people and we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't lose that sight. Gentlemen's time has expired. Th thank the gentleman. Um, concludes our uh, initial round of questions. Seeing no other uh, members.